Any questions from last time we talked? This should be the end of the material for test three for farm one. Like you kind of, you're almost like halfway done with your pharmacology curriculum here. Almost. Thank goodness, right? Except farm two is like double the hours of this one, so just means more time together. Like what could be better, right? Anywho. Um, so we're talking about our chemo meds, right? We're kind of getting into the principles of how we're using them. Remember, we mentioned that are these uh, medications entirely devoid of side effects? No, these are in general pretty nasty medications here. And this is why uh, weighing risk versus benefits is really important. And we're trying to maximize the benefits of killing off as many cancer cells as we can while trying to minimize the toxicity that the patient's experiencing, right? And so what kind of toxicities have we talked about already? Hair loss, nausea, vomiting, what else? Diarrhea, certainly. Fatigue, yeah, absolutely. Muscle wasting, right? Like these patients are not going to be good nutrition because they probably don't want to eat because they're nauseous all the time. Mild suppression and resulting in suppress your white cells. Infection, yeah, infection is huge, right? It's going to be the uh, big cause of mortality for a lot of these patients you run into. Um, and so typically what you're going to find is when we're administering these drugs, we try to go with a sort of high dose and intermittent schedule. What does that mean to say intermittent? Kind of like every once in a while, right? And so typically you may find that they'll be on a regimen where they're getting, say, cyclophosphamide on day one and then day 14 and then day 28 or something, right? So you'll see that it's very specific regimens there. But the idea is by giving a really big dose up front, you kind of suppress as many of those rapidly dividing cells as you can, kill off a lot of cancerous cells, and then you give the body time to recover. And that way you don't just keep hitting them over and over and over again with the same really toxic medication because that can ultimately lead to their demise as you'll see and so other things we'll also consider is sort of the time for maximum susceptibility depending on where these drugs work and we'll talk about those specifically um, some of them are going to work in different parts of the cell cycle so does anyone remember their basic biology S phase and G phase and all the G zero. Oh, we're going to get a good refresher of that. Don't worry. Um, but certain drugs will work in certain parts of the cell cycle, right? Some of them work on when they're actually undergoing mitosis. Some are working when they're producing new DNA, etc. And then we're going to see where the tumor is at in that growth curve. And if you remember that growth curve, remember there's a plateau at a certain point. When did that plateau happen? Basically, the tumor was outstripping its nutrient supply and it cannot continue to grow much further because it really just doesn't have a lot of additional uh, nutrient supply to do so. And so, do you think the tumor is really fast growing when it's in that plateau phase or maybe when it's kind of in that, that really rapid ramping up phase? The ramping up, right? Because again, a lot of them are rapidly dividing. The tumor is growing exponentially in size. That's when most of those cells are going to be very susceptible to the medications we're going to use. So getting into, and again, this is a good sort of reference sort of slide to go back to and see where these different drugs are working at. And we'll talk about all these ones specifically as we get into it. But normally looking at the cell cycle, you can see here that, uh, for instance, we have like our G0 phase. Like what is normally happening there? So just kind of doing their thing, right? They're just kind of going about their normal job. Uh, do you think a lot of your cancer cells are in the G0 phase? No, they are very frequently going to be in the G1, S phase, G2 phase, and are undergoing active mitosis, right? And so you'll find that different medications will be working at different spots here. So for instance, uh, say during the S phase, what is happening there? We're having our DNA production actually happening. You're producing new DNA in those cases there. And so you'll find that drugs that directly interfere with that cell's ability to produce new DNA are going to be really effective during S phase. So if you can target it to where you have the majority of those cells in the S phase, then that's going to be that much more effective, right? So those are cell cycle specific sort of drugs, and we'll mention them as we get into specific details. We also have what we call cell cycle non-specific drugs, and these will kind of work at any point. Um, you'll tend to find these tend to be a little bit harsher in terms of toxicity as well, as we'll see a little bit later on there. So when we talk, start talking about things like our alkylating agents and anthracyclines, those are t typically pretty toxic sort of medications. So uh, as you mentioned, you know, G0 resting phase, not really where we're so concerned about our, or where a lot of our cancer cells are going to be in, but really working on either mitosis phase or through G1S and the G2 phase. That's where a lot of our drugs are going to be working at. We'll talk about those uh, specifically. Again, we'll talk about different classes that are going to be non-cell cycle specific and they'll work on any of these, right? They'll be able to directly attack those cells based on their mechanisms of action, as we'll see. So um, 
some different terms you're going to see there include things like the growth fraction. That's going to be what we call the proportion of cells that are actively undergoing mitosis. So if you have a higher growth fraction, typically that's where your drugs are going to be more effective, especially if they're cell cycle specific. Um, we also have what we call like, the S fraction, and that's going to be the, the portion of those that are actually undergoing the active DNA um, uh, replication. Again, the higher that fraction is, typically the more aggressive the tumor is, and that kind of also leads into the doubling time. So you think a longer or shorter doubling time would be more worrisome for the patient? Shorter, right? Because I mean, they're replicating very, very quickly. So for instance, like leukemias, they can replicate extremely quickly. You can find patients with extremely high white cell counts. Um, they can be pretty dangerous, especially when you start chemotherapy. We'll talk about why that is a little bit later. So. Um, Using our medications here, we're going to find that combination therapy is sort of the norm. We're going to use different types of anti-chemo drug or uh, anti-cancer drugs via different mechanisms to get better kill rates. Here, the point is to minimize resistance because do our cells become resistant to chemotherapy? They can't, right? Just like an, uh, a bacteria can become resistant to an antibiotic, our cells can actually do the same thing. If you think about it, it makes sense because they're rapidly dividing. They can may have mutations. They can do things to become more resistant to them. And so that can become a problem. So by using combo therapy, you can get around that to some degree. It also helps to minimize the, uh, the toxicity by using meds with different mechanisms there. So that's the actual, oh, yes, sir. Wouldn't there be more side effects? Well, uh, maybe specific side effects from those individual drugs, but overall the doses of the drugs can be mitigated. You can use lesser amounts of the drugs, and that can help with the, the side effects there, right? Um, we also talk about adjuvant therapy. When I say adjuvant therapy, what does that mean? Yeah, something we're adding on to the regimen that may not have anti-cancer effects itself, but will certainly help out the patient. So for instance, we mentioned that nausea vomiting is a very common side effect for the majority of uh, chemotherapeutic agents here. Um, and so by adding on anti-emetic drugs as an adjuvant, it doesn't do anything for the cancer, but it makes the patient feel a whole lot better if they're not actively uh, retching, right? Also things that we can do to like stimulate, for instance, like the bone marrow. Right, we have different um, agents we'll talk about there, and that's what we talk about when we say supportive therapy. Those are the type of meds that they're going to fall into that category, going the adjuvant meds we'll add on. I have a whole section on that later on. So, as I mentioned, the timing of the chemotherapy is important, determining um, kind of where the cells are going to be at in terms of their um, cell cycles. And sometimes we'll actually try to target, because again, if you look at, say, a tumor, um, are you think all of them are going to be in S phase at the exact same time? All of them will be going to undergo mitosis at the same time. It doesn't work that way, right? You'll have different cells in different parts of it. There may be a higher proportion that's there in the S phase, uh, say, than, than other phases. But sometimes what we'll do is actually give a medication over, say, the course of several days, right? So what, is, what benefit does that give? Yeah, eventually you're going to hit all of those cells as they enter into those various phases there, depending on the actual growth of the tumor, how aggressive it is. And so sometimes you'll see, say, um, we'll do a 24-hour continuous infusion. Sometimes we'll do like a five-day continuous infusion of medication, and that will allow the medication to be administered consistently throughout that time. So that as cells enter in the, into those specific cell, um, cycles, they'll be able to uh, be affected by the, by the drug, right? So there's different ways we can do that. And I'll show you an example of a chemo regimen because, um, of course, I'm not going to have you memorize all the different regimens because every time you get into a specific type of cancer, like there's a million different types of regimens to be dealing with. Um, and you'll find that as people get into chemotherapy, depending on who you work with, like you get really specialized. Like if you just do breast cancer, like that's just what you know, right? And so you, you, know, you have a patient who comes in with leukemia, you may not be as well versed on that because you do end up getting pretty specialized depending on where you're working at. But anyway, um, you'll see the non-cell cycle specific agents there, again, are going to be um, not schedule dependent. They can kind of be given at any point, no, no problems there. And so, as I mentioned, chemotherapy is given in cycles. You'll see it maybe on cycle one, cycle two, depending on uh, kind of what regimen they're on there. And that allows for that time for recovery, okay? It allows the time for their bone marrow to start to, to recover there, to allow for their white counts to come back up, and that allows for them to, again, not succumb to those infections, okay? And very frequently, if I'm a lot of these patients, especially if you work with oncology and pediatrics, most of the patients are going to be on clinical trials. Because again, is it uh, ethical to say, for instance, give two different kids cancer and then give them different, right? We can't really do that, right? So again, it's one of those things where um, it's going to be more of a convenient sort of thing. Like as kids come in or as adults come in with this type of cancer, we'll see if they want to be enrolled into a clinical trial to see what are the best regimens to use for those uh, particular patients, right? So uh, if you ever hear of like COG, that stands for Children's Oncology Group, and that's a big... Um, 
the or big organization for pediatric patients uh, who, who get cancer, and they'll be on all kinds of different regimens there. Now, ethically, does it make sense to say you have like a gold standard regimen of chemotherapy, and then you have like a new experimental one that you want to give um, to enter patients into that? Well, if you give them the option, certainly, right? So, in in as Consent is really important part of that as well. Um, and sometimes we just don't know what really the gold standard is yet. We try different regimens to see what's going to work better for those patients, and then that eventually becomes a gold standard potentially. So here's an example of a chemo roadmap. This is actually one that we use over at uh, Nemours, for instance. Um, and again, it looks like a lot of information all at once, but we can kind of make heads and tails of it as we go through. And so, for instance, here you can see this is the type of regimen that they're on. This is for what we call consolidation, right? So this is where we're trying to get those counts down to those cancerous cells uh, to as few as possible. And so this is another one that's going to be given on several cycles. And so this is for a patient with ALL that's been randomized to a certain arm of a trial. So this is part of a clinical trial. They got randomized to one arm versus another, and this is what they, they end up getting here. So. What you're going to see here is that um, sometimes the different medications we give can be contingent on things like their blood counts. So, for instance, we mentioned myelosuppression is a common side effect from these medications here. Do you know what ANC stands for? It stands for absolute neutrophil count. Okay. So normally when you get a CBC back, you get a white cell count, and then how do all the other components get expressed? You're saying percentages, right? Like when you're looking for like a left shift on a, on a CBC or something with their differential. Um, and so what you can actually do is take those percentages, say for instance of the neutrophils, and multiply it by that white cell count, and that gives you an absolute neutrophil count. Now why do you think we care about the absolute neutrophil count in a, pain, uh, a patient with cancer? We need to know they're going to be how susceptible they're going to be to infection. So and get, again, if their white count is so low and their neutroph uh, neutrophil count is so low that they are going to be so susceptible to infection, we don't give them any more chemotherapy. We wait until their counts recover and then we can administer that. Right? What about their platelets? You can see here over seventy-five thousand platelets. Why do we care about that? They can be bleeding risk, right? So again, because you're suppressing all components of their uh, their blood production, you can see here that platelets can be taking a big hit as well. So we frequently look at neutrophil count, and then we'll also look at the platelet count to make sure they're at a certain level, and then we can go ahead and administer chemotherapy for those patients, right? So sometimes you'll be delaying chemo by weeks, potentially waiting for the patients to recover before you actually give them something. So anyway, so looking at here, we're gonna um, getting into the actual medications. Now, there's like two fields of medicine where they love to have abbreviations uh, for their medications. One's HIV, uh, and the other case here is going to be chemo. And so you'll see like a ton of abbreviations. What's the problem with using abbreviations in medicine? They can get confusing, right? And so if you're talking to a chemo practitioner and they're like, okay, the patient's on ARC and they're on Doxo, blah, 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 you may not know exactly what they're talking about. And so that can be really tough. So for instance, like cyclophosphamide gets abbreviated to CPM. Okay, that makes some sense there. Um, but there's other ones that may not make any sense whatsoever. I'm trying to think of a good one. Like Cytarabine and ARC, you're just like, well, those don't even look alike. Like, how would they even know the ARC is turning into Cytarabine? Some of it has to do with the chemical name itself and we'll look at some of that a little bit later on but just know there's a lot of abbreviations out there and so you want to be careful whenever you're dosing these medications that you have the right one that you're dealing with because again I think cyclophosphamide and cytarabine could be easy to mix up if you are not familiar with the meds right and so i don't know if any of you are interested in going into oncology but some of you may have a lot of patients who are coming in so you're working in the er and you have a patient comes in with fever who's on active chemotherapy you'd like to know what medications that they're on and so you'd want to know, okay, well, they on cytarabine, cyclophosphamide, and know kind of the side effects and things that would happen to them by being on those meds. So um, again, you can run into it anywhere. So anyway, so the different medications here, you can find the dosing, all of that. What do you notice about the dosing, how we actually dose these meds? There's per meter squared. What do you call it, meter, when you have like a, uh, the body surface area, right? So frequently you find these medications are dosed in body surface area. Sometimes it may be in milligrams per kilo, but um, remember what's the benefit of using body surface area over just like a weight-based dosing? You're factoring the patient's height as well as their weight, right? So again, it's another way to be a little bit more precise with the actual drug dosing here. So that's one thing um, to kind of note with that. And again, they'll tell you everything, like you know, how often should you be doing things like you know their CSF counts? How often should you be doing um, you know bone marrow evaluations? They'll tell you all that in this regimen here. The thing I wanted to kind of mention though is actual the regimen itself, right? So you can kind of notice here everything is talking about in terms of days. You can see that maybe for instance they get cyclophosphamide just on day one, and then they'll be on cytarabine or ARC for days one through five. 
or one through four here, and then they'll get a couple days off, and then you give them another round of it, you know, for four days straight. Whereas here, they're going to be getting the drug uh, six more captopurine for every day throughout that regimen there. So again, it can be pretty intensive in terms of, okay, when are they getting which medications? When? And this is how the roadmaps kind of help us out to keep track of that. Um, and again, when you're thinking about medications in terms of the high risk and low risk, like acetaminophen, do you think that's like a high risk medication? No. How about like insulin? Do you think it would be a high risk medication? 100% it is. You can really kill someone if you give them the wrong kind of insulin, the wrong dose. But how about chemotherapy? Yes, it certainly is a high risk medication. And so it requires like double signatures from the providers. So normally we'll have like an MP or a PA plus the oncologist sign the orders. We'll have two pharmacists actually check it out when they're actually doing the verification. We'll have two nurses check it off before they actually give it to the patients. There's a lot of checks involved to make sure they get everything correct here. Because if you screw it up, it can cause some real harm to the patients, right? So anyway, and you see IT, what do you think that means? It's a route for medication. As in Jothical, so actually be given medication uh, through an epidural or through an actual uh, lumbar puncture. They'll do that usually under sedation and actually administer that for any cancer cells that might be actually in the CSF, right? So a lot of different ways we'll give these medications. <clears throat> So anyway, there's some other types of therapy we'll get into. This is sort of a new sort of um, class of meds we're getting into in terms of chemotherapy. This is what we call targeted therapy. And I mentioned with the kind of the old school run-of-the-mill chemo drugs, were they very specific for cancerous versus, say, non-cancerous cells? No real specificities, right? That's why we see all the to uh, toxic side effects. What we have nowadays are actually have very specific targeted therapy that can actually look for specific targets that only the cancer cells express. So for instance, we can have biologic agents that may be monoclonal antibodies. They may be other reg, uh, agents that are specifically looking for certain receptor types or certain proteins that only those cancer cells are actually expressing. So for instance, if you have a certain mutation causing a certain type of leukemia, then there's one drug that is just specifically for that. And if you give it to anyone else, it doesn't work because those patients are not expressing that sort of thing there. Um, for instance, if you have breast cancer and is expressing certain types of mutations, but you have certain uh, proteins that are there that may not be present in other patients with breast cancer, certain med medication would be really good for them. Again, the benefit here is you're getting a lot of targeted therapy just for those cancer cells. And so the toxicity is going to be much less than, right? You're going to see a lot less toxicity associated with these uh, biologic agents here. There's a ton of them that are out there, and I'm not going to talk about them uh, in great detail because there's so many new ones that are coming out all the time, but at least keep this in the back of your mind. I am going to talk about, though, the kind of the run-of-the-mill stuff you're going to see day in and day out if you run into these patients, right? Okay, and obviously early detection and treatment are super important, so make sure that people are getting their proper checks when they're supposed to, colonoscopies and, and breast checks and all those other things, um, because obviously the earlier you can catch it, the easier it's going to be to treat before it starts to have metastasize and, and all that kind of thing. Okay, so as I mentioned, in terms of toxicity, rapidly dividing cells are going to get hit, hard, hit the hardest. So certainly the neoplastic cells, that's what we're targeting, that is a good thing, but the bone marrow is going to be hit, so infection is a huge risk. Now, what do you think about if you have a patient who, and we haven't talked about immunizations at great length yet, um, what do you think about giving immunizations to someone who's immunocompromised? Think it'd be a problem? And it depends on the type. In some cases, they're ineffective because the patient doesn't have an immune system to really cause that reaction to develop those antibodies. The worst case scenario, if you give them a, a live vaccine, they can actually develop the infection that the vaccine is uh, would actually cause normally if it was like the normal uh, type of virus, right? And so in those cases there, vaccines may be important to time depending on how well reconstituted their immune system is. That's another thing to consider. Um, GI tract is going to be a huge one, so you're going to see a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea associated with these. Stomatitis is a real big issue with these patients as well, so that can lead to oral infections. That can also lead to them not having good PO intake, so sometimes these patients have to go on IV nutrition just in order to, to have them get some kind of calories into their system. Um, obviously, the alopecia is going to be another thing we've already alluded to. And then also think about things like the reproductive cells are going to be affected as well. So sperm production is going to go down. You can have a lot of menstrual irregularities there. So a lot of issues that pop up from these medications. Now, if you're actively receiving chemotherapy, should these patients worry about getting pregnant in the first place? Why not? Because think about a fetus. Do they have a lot of rapidly dividing cells? That's all they are, right? So again, these uh, tend to be very triatogenic medications that you would not want them to, uh, to get. And again, some of the drugs we're going to talk about here, they're not just for patients with cancer. We actually will sometimes use these for autoimmune conditions because this will help to tamp down that immune response by helping to suppress the bone marrow, right? And so we'll talk about those examples uh, probably next semester when we talk about rheumatology. And there's a lot of ways that our um, 
medications become or lose effectiveness for the cancer cells. So for instance, if the cancer cells develop a mutation where they have decreased uptake of the drug, the drug works on the DNA, but it can't ever get to that site, then obviously it's not going to be all that effective, right? Um, some of our uh, drugs actually work through producing free radicals. You know what that is? Besides the name of my band in high school? Reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species. Why, are, why would we use those for treatment of cancer? They wreak havoc in cells. If you have a reactive oxygen species, it denatures proteins, denatures DNA. It basically was a very fast way to trigger off apoptosis. Um, and so if they have increased free radical scavengers, these are things that can go in and, and basically neutralize those and prevent the drugs from being all that effective, right? So there's different ways the cells become resistant. And so this is why we may use different medications. May, we may use multiple drugs at the same time in order to get around some of these issues here. So, and then when you're looking at your goals of therapy, we're thinking about is, are we going for curative versus palliative treatment? So again, when would say curative treatment be more appropriate? Well, it's going to be for something that maybe is caught earlier, maybe easier to treat. When do you get into palliative care? Yeah, towards the end of life when you're maybe not looking so much at the quantity of life, but you're also looking at the quality of life, right? So just making the patient more comfortable and sometimes the uh, chemotherapy can be useful for that depending on the situation. So getting into the drugs themselves, okay? And again, this is not an all exhaustive list. You may feel exhausted after we get through this list, but <laughs> it is not exhaustive in itself. And you can see where some of the different drugs are gonna be working at. And so getting into the um, different sites where they can be working, we're gonna see that basically all parts of the cell can be potentially affected by our chemo drugs. Uh, we're going to see things like actually production of DNA can be affected here. We're going to see, and actually what's interesting is a lot of the, there's a lot of analogs between antibiotic agents and drugs that are working on cancer cells. You're going to see a lot of um, similarities between mechanisms, as we'll see in just a little bit. You can have drugs that work on things like topoisomerase. Anyone remember an antibiotic that worked on topoisomerase? Or we actually have drugs that do the same thing for cancer cells, but again, the targets are different, which is why you don't use, say, Leviquin for cancer treatment. You may if the patient has an infection secondary to their chemotherapy, but again, think about the, the clinical situation, right? So we'll get into all of these, um, and so just use this as a sort of a reference when we talk about the individual medications here. Again, if I don't mention them in the specific slides and it's listed on this here, I wouldn't worry too much about it, right? It's probably not going to come up on the test. You guys probably like it when I say probably, and most likely, and not give anything definitive, but sometimes being vague is okay, right? Anyway, um, so first getting into our anti-metabolites. When I say anti-metabolites, these are basically going to be agents that look a lot like nucleotides that make up the cell's normal DNA and RNA. And so what these are going to do, um, some of them may actually work to block the production of new nucleotides to add into the DNA or RNA. Some of these are going to be sort of imposter agents. They're going to be looking like the normal nucleotides, and then once they get incorporated into the DNA, what do you think happens? They stop, right? So remember we talked about um, the antiviral drugs like acyclovir, how they would get phosphorylated, add on to the viral DNA, and then they act as a chain terminator. They prevent any further nucleotides from being added on. These will do the same thing for some of the classes here we'll look at. And so basically the body can't tell the difference. Once it gets added on, that point is too late. It'll stop further DNA replication, may not be able to repair that, and that's what triggers off that cell death, right? And so again, these are not gonna be selective for just cancerous cells. They'll affect anything that is rapidly dividing, right? Now, if you have, say for instance, a cell that's just hanging out in G0 phase, it's not undergoing new DNA production, what do you think these uh, those cells will be affected? Not really, right? Because again, these are gonna be much more specific for that S phase of the cell cycle. And so they get into three different categories here. We're going to talk about our pyrimidine analogs, our purine analogs, and basically that just says which nucleotides they look like, essentially. And then we'll talk about our folate antagonists. Because remember, any, any antibiotics that were folate antagonists? Actually, I'm good. Sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim were the main ones we, we mentioned there. So, and again, um, you know, just be able to draw these structures on the test, or be, at least be able to identify them. I say true or false, this one is a false nucleotide. You should be able to pick that out, right? Just kidding, I'm not going to do that to you. But I will at least demonstrate the point here to show you how these can sort of look like the normal nucleotides, how they can trick the cell. All right, so for instance, here we see cytidine, right? Here's deoxycytidine, which would actually be added into the DNA itself. And then here we have cytosine, arabinocyte, or era C. That was that cytarabine we talked about a little bit earlier. So notice here, just by switching the orientation of that hydroxyl group, 
once it gets added into the DNA, you can't add anything else on to, onto that, right? So even just a very simple change can cause pretty dramatic effects on that cell's ability to produce new D DNA and RNA. And so, um, again, starting out with the primitive analogs, most of these are going to be cytidine analogs. We'll also see a few others in just a few minutes here. But basically, once they become phosphorylated, when I say phosphorylated, what does that mean? They add phosphate groups onto it, and then it gets added onto that DNA. You can't add anything else onto that at that point. So again, it's a chain terminator. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you specifically the routes, but I'm just going to give you some examples here. And I'm not going to ask you um, which one of these is used to treat leukemia, which one of these is used to treat non-small cell lung cancer. You might get some of that in, in, um, in CMS. I'm more focusing on mechanisms, drug interactions, side effects, all those sorts of things, um, because again, there's just too much to get into. I could do a whole course just on using the medications for different indications. I want you to know the basics, right? I want you to know if you have that patient comes into the ER who's taking recaptopurine, I want you to at least know what that drug is, at least know where to look for more information on it, right? So anyway, so, um, but just for example, we use this one quite frequently to treat a lot of different types of leukemia. So this is a very common one I end up using a lot uh, for our patients uh, over at Nemours. And so in terms of toxicity, you're going to find that the majority are going to have very similar sort of issues here in terms of dose limiting leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. I probably mentioned this before, have I ever talked about febrile neutropenia? That's a common reason for patients who are receiving chemotherapy to show up to the ER or the urgent care is because, again, when your white cells are that low, you can't really mount the normal immune response to infection, right? They normally uh, will have fever is really the only sign and symptom that they're going to be presenting with of infection. And so whenever you have a patient like that that shows up, low white count, history of being on chemotherapy and have a fever, that is needs to be treated pretty seriously, right? Because it could be really anything. It could be bloodstream infection, could be a pneumonia, could be a UTI, it could be a lot of different things. And so we typically go pretty aggressive in terms of our treatment there. And so we'll go with say, for instance, like a broad spectrum cephalosporin, right? Maybe like a fourth generation cephalosporin. Anyone know what a good example of that would be? Cefepime, yeah. So the majority of those patients with febrile neutropenia, they get put on cefepime, and then they'll scale it back to term, depending on what culture show, depending on how they're improving, et cetera, right? So just a little little tidbit there. Um, anyway, other things you're going to find, nausea, vomiting, super common, the majority of these chemo drugs. So again, uh, just know in general, all of them can cause nausea, vomiting. Now, they're not all created equal in those cases. You're going to find some of them will have what we call very high emetogenicity, and some of them are going to have relatively low emetogenicity, right? So the ability to produce nausea and vomiting is emetogenicity there. Um, now, if there are any kind of like unique sort of side effects, I list for the drugs outside of things like myosuppression and nausea vomit, those are probably things you want to pick up on, right? Because those are good uh, test questions that I could ask. Say, which one, a patient is on receiving chemotherapy for leukemia and they present with, you know, say for instance, this, uh, you know, dysarthria, nystagmus, and ataxia. Which medication could likely cause that, right? Those are things that you know, I could ask questions on, right? So um, anyway, you can also see, you know, this is more common, the cerebellar syndrome, excuse me, um, with more renal dysfunction, right? So they have a problem clearing the drug, they're more likely to end up seeing that, especially with those really big doses they'll get. And then you can see some conjunctivitis, keratitis. In some cases, you know, if something like a saline eye drop or some kind of tear replacement is not going to be sufficient, sometimes they'll actually give steroids as well to help kind of decrease some inflammation there and help with tear production. Another one similar to that is actually gemcitabine. Notice here they just add fluorides onto the, the molecule itself instead of those hydroxyl groups. And then again, the cell can't do anything with it at that point. Um, again, very similar mechanism, very similar side effects you're going to see with that. Um, here you may find some flu-like symptoms with that. They develop some mild fever, arthralgias, you know, something like Tylenol would be totally appropriate for those patients. However, imagine if they, for instance, they have a low platelet count, what would you not want to give them? So instead of Tylenol, if you want to give them like an NSAID, that probably might not, 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 uh, is not going to be a good idea, right? Because again, what are NSAIDs going to do their ability to clot? It's going to suppress it, right? And so again, you can find that can be a, kind of a double whammy there. Low platelet count plus an NSAID, bleeding risk is going to be higher, okay? So that definitely be something you want to watch out for. So um, next we have our pyrimidine analogs here. So we have 5-fluorouracil five, five or 5-FU. That was always my favorite drug whenever we were in medicinal chemistry in pharmacy school. I always thought it was funny. I'd say, hey, buddy, 5-F-U. <laughs> Tell pharmacy school is pretty funny. Pretty, pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you got to find fun where you can, right? Um, 
Anyway, so this one uh, is going to be working a little bit differently here. Here again, it's a false pyrimidine. So it actually inhibits this enzyme called thymidylate synthase. And so basically it prevents the formation of thymidine, right? So instead of uh, maybe getting incorporated into the DNA itself, it actually inhibits the actual production of a nucleotide thymidine, and that then prevents DNA replication from occurring there. And so you're going to find that here this, and don't memorize this whole process here, I just illustrated to show you how you can have multiple drugs that work on the same pathway. So, and this is actually a really important pathway for folate. And so we'll talk about uh, anyone know what MTX stands for? Yeah, we'll talk about methotrexate in a little bit later and how that's going to be interacting here. Um, what was that? Should beat you to it? It's too bad. Snooze you lose. All right. <laughs> Anywho. So anyways, you can find that different drugs will be working on different steps of the pathway there. So what do you think it does in terms of activity? Does it improve it? Yeah, right, so you get better synergy sometimes if you were to, say, have a regimen of, say, MTX or methotrexate plus five, something like 5 fluorouracil working together, right? And again, a lot of abbreviations for these drugs, so um, I'm not going to ask any abbreviations on the test. I'll give you the actual full drug name, just FYI, but that's why you see a lot of these um, you know, graphs and charts and things will have the abbreviations on that, okay? <clears throat> And again, this another one you can see that Sarah Villar syndrome for. And also, uh, this can actually cause it called hand foot syndrome. Anyone know what that stands for or what that means? It's probably something that affects the hands and the feet. That makes sense. Um, these are peripheral neuropathies that can develop these medications there, right? And so those really long distal sort of neurons tend to be affected most frequently. And so that's why you end up seeing another name for it could be like a stocking glove sort of distribution. So if you see like a hand foot syndrome, um, that's kind of the same thing, right? So you get that distribution with those long, long nerves, uh, distal nerves are going to be affected there. So usually the tips of the fingers, you get that, um, that tingling or they get, um, you know, burning sensations. It can be painful in some cases and it may not be reversible in a lot of cases as well. So that's something else to know. And actually we'd have some patients who were getting a certain group of medications that could also do this. And we would not actually sign any of the orders until the patient got in and the oncologist could actually like talk to the patient, see how those neuropathies are developing. If they're getting any worse, then we actually would hold off on the medication because it was so um, problematic to the patient there. Uh, another drug similar to 5-FU uh, is actually going to be called capsidabine. This one actually just gets converted over to 5-FU, so very similar in, in terms of activity. Uh, next we have purine analogs, so now we're kind of switching from the pyrimidines over to the purines here. So this one here we have called 6 mercaptopurine or 6-MP is a common way you'll see this being abbreviated here. Uh, another one is very similar in activity to it. It's called thioguanine. And again, you can see how they're very similar in structure. Again, they're subbing in for those normal purine nucleotides will be added into the DNA. Um, and so these are going to be affecting guanine, adenine most commonly. And again, by getting incorporated into the DNA, they prevent any further chain elongation, very similar to what we saw with, say, the cytarabine we saw a few slides ago, okay? Again, very similar toxicity profile here. Um, what's actually interesting is some patients, they actually have a pharmacogenetic predisposition, they have a mutation themselves that actually leads to worsen toxicity. And again, it's not something we can commonly screen for, so it's one of those cases where you give the medication to the patient, see how they respond, and if it's not very good, then they may, they may have that mutation there. So it may uh, lead to dose adjustments down, it may lead to stopping the medication altogether, depending on the regimen. Uh, next we have our folate antagonist. This is a big one called methotrexate. I'll spend some time talking about this mainly because um, you're going to see this drug used quite frequently for rheumatology purposes. You're going to see this a lot for rheumatoid arthritis specifically. We'll talk a lot about it there as well. And so again, this is going to be what we call a folate antagonist. And normally folic acid is very important for producing those nucleotides, right? Especially thymidine, very important for that. If you inhibit that process by basically inhibiting this enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase, um, you will prevent the recycling there of that folic acid and thus you cannot produce other purine synthesis, okay? So you're decreasing DNA production, RNA production that eventually leads to that program, cell death, right? This is a super common one we use for tons of different uh, leukemias over at Nemours. Um, this is probably the most common one I run into um, outside of something like vincristine, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, this one's also good as well because it is orally bioavailable. So if you have a patient who's taking it for, say, rheumatologic purposes, they can just use this as an at-home sort of thing here. Yes, sir? It has been used in the past to induce abortions. Why do you think that would be um, used to cause a chemical abortion, essentially? And so, like, you know folic acid is really important for pregnant women anyway, right? Like, so again, imagine if you blocked use of folic acid entirely in those patients, certainly it would kill off that, that fetus, right? So again, that has been a case where that's been used previously. Um, there's some other medications we can mention later on that also uh, have been used for that similar purpose there, but certainly methotrexate is one. Um, 
but anyway, so um, very common medication you're going to use there. Now imagine if you were, say, dealing with a patient with like leukemia where their, their white cells are rapidly dividing, uh, causing this cancer, versus, say, someone with, like I say, a rheumatologic condition. Which one do you think would require higher doses of methotrexate? I haven't gotten to room too much, but what do you think would require higher doses? Because here I'm trying to get rid of every single cancer cell I can. Versus there I'm just trying to sort of tamp down the immune system a little bit. Probably higher doses are going to be seen with cancer treatment, right? So dose is really important here as well. I may be giving these patients a gram, like, you know, grams of methotrexate at a time to try to get rid of all the cancerous white cells versus, say, a patient with, rheumato um, with uh, rheumatoid arthritis maybe getting five, 10 milligrams a day or something, right? So again, it really depends on the patient and the indications you're using it for. And you look at a patient and say, what kind of doses are they receiving? It doesn't make sense based off the indication there, right? So anyway, there's some other things to note with methotrexate. Um, this is another important thing as well. If I list any antidotes for a medication, those are a fair game as well, because um, this is an important thing to know is how we can rescue the, the normal healthy cells and try to prevent toxicity from these medications here. So here's an example, the first one we have of an actual antidote to go along with the drug itself, okay? So other things you're gonna find with methotrexate is gonna be um, certainly myelosuppression, GI toxicity we've talked about. This can actually lead to things like hepatotoxicity, so you do wanna watch out for um, liver function tests for this one, you wanna monitor for that. And then also, another important thing here is the renal toxicity. And so one thing you want to make sure your patients are doing is make sure they're drinking plenty of water when they're taking methotrexate. Um, and also in some cases, we'll actually give things to try to prevent methotrexate from precipitating out in the renal tubules. And we kind of mentioned this before, we talked about like acyclovir doing this, but what do you think happens when that drug precipitates out in the renal tubules? Think the, the kidneys like that? No. They don't, right? So you can see significant, um, basically clogging up the kidneys, so to speak, and cause significant interstitial damage to the kidneys there. And so sometimes what we actually have to do is give them, uh, we actually alkalinize the urine. When I say alkalinize, what does that mean? You raise the pH of it up. And so how do we do that? Anyone know? Give them bicarb, yeah. So we give them sodium bicarb, and that actually helps to raise the pH of the urine up, and that will help it go back into solution. So sometimes you may see that where patients are getting bicarbonate plus really big doses of methotrexate, and the goal is to try to preserve kidney function. Um, is to try to get as much fluid as we can to flush those kidneys out, and then that way it helps prevent toxicity. So is that why they measure the pH of their urine when they are on Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Um, you know, if you're getting relatively low doses for, say, like a rheumatologic condition, probably not because it's not really big enough doses to cause an issue. Um, but certainly if you're getting it for, say, uh, cancer, um, we may actually, for instance, um, we have some regimens where the nurse can't start the methotrexate until they've been receiving the bicarb and they check the urine and once at a certain pH, then they'll administer the, the methotrexate at that point, yeah. So that could certainly be another really important monitoring parameter. So um, also you can see some protein interactions if you have something that kicks methotrexate off the proteins, that's another thing to consider. So looking at antidotes, now we mentioned that methotrexate blocks the activity of folic acid by preventing that enzyme folic acid reductase. Well, how could I fix that problem? How could I get around it? I give them the activated form of folic acid, and this is when we get into folinic acid, or another name for this is called leucovorin. Okay, so if you're here like a leucovorin rescue, or giving someone folinic acid, now you may think like, well, this sounds counterintuitive. Why would I give the activated form of folic acid? Those cancer cells are going to start to use that, right? A little bit, right? But what are we trying to salvage. The other surrounding healthy cells that are non-cancerous, right? So the point is you give really big doses of methotrexate up front, kind of trying to knock down as many of those cancer cells as you can, and then you give them folinic acid as a follow-up in order to help recover those normal healthy cells, hopefully keep the white count relatively okay, um, keep their platelets up, etc., and make sure they can get the next round when they're ready for it, okay? And so, um, and actually, you know, this is sometimes we get cases like this at the poison center. We'd have patients who are actually taking uh, incorrect doses of, uh, of leuco I'm sorry, incorrect doses of methotrexate. I'll never forget, I remember the, the fellow who was a year ahead of me at the time. Um, it's really embarrassing if you're a consultant on the phone and like you make a mistake and then you have to call the person back afterwards. And so this is one of those examples where, um, you know, we're all kind of in the, the consult room working. Our attending was there as well. Um, and the uh, case was someone had gotten too much methotrexate, and they're like, okay, what do you do? So the fellow's like, okay, well, let's go ahead and give this much folic acid, blah, 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 and go through the whole thing. And then hangs up the phone, and the attending goes, what did you tell me to give? Is that a folic acid? Oh, no. So then they had to call back and kind of scratch that. Actually use folinic acid because it's a really important point because if we just gave folic acid, what would happen? It wouldn't work, right? Because the methotrexate is preventing it from being utilized. So this is why the folinic acid is really an important part here as the rescue medication, okay? So that's going to be really important. Sodium bicarb, as I mentioned, alkalizes the urine to prevent that precipitation out. 
And actually another option we have here is an in, uh, a drug called glucarpidase. There's actually a synthetic enzyme we have that actually goes and directly metabolizes the, uh, the methotrexate. So if we had someone who, for instance, had significant renal dysfunction, all of a sudden they couldn't clear that methotrexate, sometimes we use glucarpidase um, in order to get rid of any methotrexate in the system. Um, it's rarely used, mainly because it is extremely expensive. I think it's on the order of like 100 grand or something for a single dose. Um, and so we really hold off unless a patient has like significant renal failure or really high levels we need to get rid of immediately, right? So those are the anti-metabolites, right? So you have your purine, pyrimidine analogs, and then your folic antagonists, those are the main ones in that category. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit, talk about microtubule targeting drugs. Why do we care about microtubules in these cancer cells? They pull apart the chromosomes, right? So remember, the chromosomes line up along the, the division line of the cell and then they pull them apart. What happens if I interrupt that process? You, uh, mitosis is arrested, it is stopped, and guess what? Eventually it will trigger off the apoptosis. The cell detects, hey, something's going wrong here. Let's just kind of end it all. You know, these cells are kind of fatalistic when it comes down to it. They're just like, oh man, slightest hiccup comes along the road, just, no, let's just end it, right? But that's okay. This is actually a good thing in these cases here because we want to get rid of those cancer cells. Um, so what we're going to find, we have two main types of drugs that are going to be working here. We have the taxanes, and then we'll have the vinca alkaloids. And so anytime I have a plant uh, that is producing some of these medications, I always like to make note of that. So you remember any other notable plants we've talked about? The Joxin, yeah, where do you get that from? Oleander, Lily of the Valley, right? Um, how about aspirin, where does that come from? The willow tree, right? You can get it from willow bark, for sure. These are good trivia points, right? So again, we're going out, doing trivia nights. The answers, these questions might come up, you never know. I'm trying to prepare you for your, your futures, okay? <laughs> anyway, so this is another case here. This probably is not going to come up at trivia night, but again, you can you know, wow your friends if you're ever, let's say, uh, out visiting uh, you know, an arboreum or something like that. And you say, hey, look at this. This actually get chemo drugs from this. Anyway, so the taxanes are the first one. We have two uh, drugs here. We have paclitaxel and then we have docetaxel. And so these actually come from the yew plant, the yew tree. Not a me tree, but it's a yew tree. <laughs> Y E W, um, and actually it's kind of funny because we, um, my wife and I, one time for an anniversary, actually went over to Ireland and they had yew trees all over the place. And so I was like, oh, this is great. Don't eat these plants because it might treat your cancer. And she's like, I don't have cancer. And I said, I know, but don't eat them anyway because they could be really toxic. She's like, I probably wasn't going to eat anything off a tree anyway. <laughs> I was like, that was good. Um, my job here is done. <laughs> anyway. So what you're going to find here, the, the taxanes, how they're going to work is essentially to promote the formation of the microtubules, but then they prevent the breakdown, right? So they prevent them from being uh, metabolized and gotten rid of, and that again can stop the mitosis process there, right? So that's how these ones are specifically going to work. Um, and so in terms of toxicities here, you get a little bit of uh, difference uh, from some of the other medications we've talked about. So certainly mild suppression is going to be a serious one here. Um, what's interesting with docetaxel, it can actually see fluid retention. That's one thing you'd want to note with that. And, and again, who might that be problematic for? If someone's like CHF potentially, right? Someone would say, um, you know, ascites due to cirrhosis or something like that. How would I get rid of that fluid? So I could either withhold fluids, maybe for, uh, not give as much, or diuretics could be useful there. It's like a loop diuretic maybe used as part of these regimens in order to get rid of some of that extra fluid if it was building up, right? Uh, paclitaxel is also going to cause neurotoxicity. So this is another one of those peripheral neuropathies that can develop in that hand-foot sort of distribution. So that would be another thing you'd want to know and be monitoring for as the patients are coming back, getting their regimens in there. And so hypersensitivity is also going to be a problem with these medications. So oftentimes what we're going to do is we'll pre-treat with things like a corticosteroid, right? So what could I use there? prednisone, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, any of those would be totally appropriate. I can give beforehand, and that helps to limit any of the um, potential for severe allergic reactions to these medications, right? So uh, what else could I give in addition to corticosteroid? How else would you treat anaphylaxis? Yeah, you could use an H1 antagonist, right? You use uh, an antihistamine beforehand as well, potentially. Uh, would I give epi prior to? No, that one you wouldn't want. To, that one you'd want to reserve for if they actually have a true reaction. Okay. Uh, next, we have the vinca alkaloids. Anyone know what kind of plants these are? No amateur botanist in the in the group. These are actually periwinkle plants. So the periwinkle actually produces the vinca alkaloids. 
And again, am I going to have a question on the test that asks you specifically which plant produces this drug? No, I'm not going to do that. But uh, I have a serious question. I only have 50 questions to really test your knowledge. I'm not going to waste it on silly trivia, okay? So get your priorities in order. Anyway, so we have a couple of drugs in this category here. We have vincristine, we have vinblastine, and venerelbine. I will tell you, me and my wife, very shortly, for maybe a few seconds, considered naming our child Christine based off the drug. Uh, but we said, like, chemotherapy, kind of poisonous. Mm. However, Lily is named Lily, which is like Lily of the Valley. That was not intentional, but there you go. So again, there are some, some plant-based names in, in my family, so to speak. Anyway, so those are the three main vinca alkaloids you're going to run into. And so these are going to work a little differently from the taxines, because whereas the taxines prevented the breakdown of already functioning uh, microtubules, these actually will bind directly to tubulin and disrupt the actual formation. So these work on the actual production of microtubules, whereas the taxines worked on the breakdown of them. So a, a distinction, but one that is certainly worth noting here. Um, and again, cells can't complete mitosis, so ultimately the result is going to be the same. You're arresting mitosis. And again, which phase of the cell cycle is this mainly going to be working on? mitosis phase, right? Because again, they're inhibiting mitosis, so you would be working on the M phase, right? So kind of think through the mechanism, it'll kind of make sense on where in the cell cycle these are going to be working, right? So one thing to note with the vinca alkaloids, this is super important, these are fatal if given intrathecally, okay? They may think, well, how would I ever accidentally give this medication intrathecally? Well, how do you think we found out that it's fatal if given intrathecally? People have screwed it up and they've made mistakes before and this is a big problem because the issue is is that very frequently patients are getting intrathecal medications at the same time as they're getting vincristine, right? So it's a very common occurrence where they'll get intrathecal methotrexate plus vincristine IV at the same time and if you don't want to screw those up, right? So we do, we have certain safety precautions in place. So for instance, like all of our intrathecal drugs come in a IV syringe, right? So when they do the lumbar puncture, then they can attach to the syringe and they're good to go. We never ever put vincristine or any of the vinca alkaloids into a syringe. We always put it into an IV bag, right? Little things like that can be utilized in order to help prevent some of these medication errors uh, because it could be so deleterious to the patient there. You guys ever heard of a sentinel event? It's not something from like the X-Men, but it's something where um, essentially if you cause significant um, morbidity and mortality to that patient, and sometimes that can lead to death, uh, that's called a sentinel event. That's a, not a great thing to be a part of. You never ever want to be um, listed on the people involved in that sort of thing there. Big deal in hospitals. Anyway, um, other things you're going to see here, again, mild suppression being a big issue. Um, also, vincristine, this can cause dose-limiting neurotoxicity. So that's the other drug I mentioned where like, the oncologist wouldn't even sign the orders for the drug until the patient presented and actually um, you know, actually did an exam on him and saw how the, uh, the neuropathies were actually developing there. Um, so that can be a big issue. And then also they can develop this paralytic ileus and constipation. That's another unique sort of thing with vincristine we wanted to know. And then a uh, final note here is that these are going to be vesicants. You know what that means? So vesicants probably cause vesicoles, right? These are drugs that are extremely irritating to the tissue if they go outside of the vein when you're administering them, right? What do you call that when things go outside of the vein? Extravasation, right? So these are extreme vesicants. These are a big deal if they accidentally go outside of it. So what do we do to prevent that? Well, we do things like putting our drugs through a central line, right? When I say central line, where does that usually empty out into? right in the vena cava, right? So that way it goes right to the heart. It's very diluted by all the venous return coming back to the right side of the heart, right? So that's one way we can help to prevent that. Um, you know, we try to not give these in a peripheral line because those tend to be more likely to extravasate, right? Especially in little kids, their veins are smaller, they're more delicate, they have that risk there. So that's why it's really important the nurses double check to make sure the line is good and it's flushing appropriately, et cetera, before administering one of these medications here. Um, and so there's a whole, series of things we can do for those patients sometimes, and it's very drug dependent. Sometimes we'll give heat to try to disperse the medication to absorb faster. Sometimes we'll give cold. Sometimes we'll have certain medications we can give to prevent further toxicity, but just know for our purposes, these are extreme vesicants. We'll have a few more of those that also come up under that list as well. And this is just kind of a picture just showing you where the different agents are gonna be working here. Um, again, there's different protein sites where the drugs can actually bind to interrupt with the microtubules. Um, so for instance here, like Paclitax will have a different target than say vincristine, and that makes sense why they'd be working on either the formation or the breakdown of the microtubules. Um, again, usually you don't see those two given together, even though they could presumably cause some more synergy. Um, typically we go with a little bit different of a mechanism in those cases there. But also, colchicine, anyone know what you use that for? Yeah. 
use for gout, right? And so we'll talk about that probably next semester. But again, this is again working on the microtubules, so that'll be another important factor here a little bit later on. Okay, so any questions so far? Yes, ma'am. So that would be something you would actually see um, while they're there getting the medication. Most of the time, these medications are being given via like, via IV infusion, right? So the patients are coming into like an infusion center. The nurse would immediately start to notice. A pain, the patient would probably start complaining of pain first, but certainly you can start to see uh, edema starting to develop around the site where it's uh, infiltrating. Um, probably develop, you know, erythema. I mean, a lot, a lot of pain because it's basically just tissue destruction happening right at the site. Um, and so there's a whole you know, protocol that goes into how we actually deal with that for sure. Any other questions? If not, let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back and then continue on. Okay, so question on here. They're saying, uh, say a patient has a low ANC slash platelet count. Could you get platelets to bump the levels up to start therapy sooner? Um, so I'll say for the ANC, there's not a lot you can do in the very acute sort of phase. There's not like a white cell infusion that I can give to the patient. Um, certainly, we'll talk about some adjuvant meds we can actually use to stimulate white cell formation. We'll talk about that later on. Um, I've never seen platelets being given in order. So say like the patient had an isolated thrombocytopenia, the ANC was fine. I've never seen them actually give platelets to bump them back up because the issue is more so their production of the platelets. So as soon as all those platelets are gone after say seven to 10 days or so, then they're kind of back in the same situation, uh, but even more suppressed in terms of their formation. So that's not to say it's never happened. I've just never encountered it. So it's probably not, not super common. But again, my perspective is mainly limited to pediatric oncology. That's the thing I see sort of day in and day out when I'm there at the hospital. I don't have a whole lot of interactions with adult oncology. Because again, I don't even like oncology that much, but sometimes you gotta do stuff at your job you just don't like, but it's what it is, right? Okay, so uh, any questions from the first half there? We talked about anti-metabolites, we talked about one agents that work on the microtubules. Now we get to move into topoisomerase inhibitors. So, right, you can kind of think about these mechanisms as being similar to the fluoroquinolones. Uh, again, normally topoisomerase one and two are gonna be working to cause the single strand breaks Actually, topoisomerase 2 does double strand breaks in the DNA, uh, and then we'll then reseal them. By using these medications here, we're going to prevent that process from happening, the resealing effect, and thus it causes further DNA damage, and that can eventually lead to that apoptosis actually being developed there, okay? Also, can lead to things like mutation. It can lead to things where uh, different strands will be um, mixed together. They shouldn't have been. Basically, just a lot of DNA damage happening here, and that's going to lead to that cell death. Um, I'm not going to get super specific and ask you which one works on topoisomerase 1 versus 2, but I would certainly know that it is a topoisomerase inhibitor in general, and that's probably as granular as I'm going to get there. Okay? So we're going to have a couple of different agents in this category. We're going to have the epidophilotoxins, which is, again, another word you can use to impress your friends. Uh, we're going to have the anthracyclines, and then we're going to have the canthothecans. Okay? So this is actually another uh, case here. These are actually uh, the mayapple plant is where you uh, see the epidophilotoxins come from. I wasn't going to ask anyone if they knew what that was. I assume no one knows what that is. All right. Um, anyway, uh, so we have a couple agents here. We have etoposide and then we have teniposide. These are the two main epidophilotoxins we're going to run into. And so again, these are working by inhibiting that topoisomerase 2 by causing further strand breaks, further DNA damage, and cell death. Um, things to note with this one, again, very dose limiting in terms of myelosuppression, nausea, vomiting. These ones tend to be a little bit worse in terms of causing alopecia. Not every chemo, uh, chemo drug is going to cause alopecia. Certain ones tend to be, have a higher propensity than others. This is a group that does certainly cause so uh, a little more often. Okay. Next, we have the anthracyclines. This is kind of an interesting group of drugs here. Um, and again, I always like to know if drugs are like a particular color um, because, again, they can sometimes cause you know patients to be stained a different color sometimes, their tears or the urine, things like that. Um, this is a, a group of very red medications. So we have things like doxorubicin, donorubicin, and the mitoxantrone is going to be also fitting into this category here. And so uh, these basically are going to be inhibiting topoisomerase 2 to some degree. They also have some other ancillary actions here. And so uh, if you kind of notice the structure here, it has this kind of four-ring structure. It's kind of very planar in terms of orientation. And so it does something called it intercalates into the DNA. I think that's one of my favorite words to say. So I do like this lecture. You get to say intercalate more. Um, but what does anyone know what that means? 
basically just kind of slides in between the DNA there and it causes conformational changes. It kind of disrupts the binding between some of the nucleotides there and that further causes more DNA damage. In addition to that, it also causes free radical production, right? So there's a reactive oxygen species. And when I say free, uh, reactive oxygen species, what does that mean? Anyone know? It's a free radical. Yes, it is a free radical. Basically, what it means is that there's an oxygen with just one electron available to bind instead of two, and so it becomes very reactive. It wants to it wants to find another electron to complete that outer ring, and so it will do that with proteins. It'll do that with DNA. It'll find anything that it can to, to interact with. It's a very reactive species. Um, that's kind of why, like for instance, hydrogen peroxide. You want to know why that's a good disinfectant? What's the chemical structure of uh, hydrogen peroxide, the chemical formula? H2O2, so when that breaks apart into two hydroxyl groups, OH with just one electron on each end of those, um, they are very interactive with things like bacteria, which is why it's a good disinfectant. Um, with these, though, they're doing similar things. They're producing free radicals, and that can cause a lot of tissue damage, as you're going to see. These are also really strong vesicants, which makes sense based off their mechanism of action and that free radical damage they can cause. So in terms of toxicity, myelosuppression, again, nothing new there. This is a new thing, though. It can cause cardiomyopathies that can lead to CHF in these patients. And in fact, there's a lifetime max dose that these patients can get, which means that once they hit a certain cap on these drugs, they can never receive it ever again. Even if their cancer relapses, and it might be the best drug in the world for them, the cardiotoxicity is such that the risk outweighs the benefits. And so you'd have to find a different medication to give. And so very frequently, what would you need to have performed in order to assess for that degree of cardiomyopathy? You get a lot of echoes being done, right? So that way you can look at one at baseline and then you can follow up with them later on to kind of see how they've progressed, right? Certainly some patients get stopped earlier than their lifetime max because they already noticed that they're having some of that cardiomyopathy develop. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that the myocardium has a relatively low ability to deal with those free radicals, right? Normally our cells have a lot of things like antioxidants and things that can deal with those free radicals. The, cardi uh, the myocardium just really can't do that. So you also see red discoloration of the urine and the sweat, which makes sense based off the color of the medication itself. And as I mentioned, it's a strong vesicant. These do have an antidote, and this is called dexrazoxane, or Xenicard is a good brand name for that. Uh, to remember, this is going to be uh, basically uh, an chelator. And I said chelator, what does that mean? It's to bind up to other things, usually metals. And in this case here, it actually binds, uh, or chelates iron, and actually helps prevent the free radical formation. And so what we'll actually do is give this as a cardioprotective agent, and sometimes we'll actually give the dexrazoxine before we give, say, the doxorubicin in order to prevent the myocardial toxicity from developing there. And sometimes that can actually give them a higher max lifetime dose that they can receive depending on, on the regimen there. So again, think anthracyclines, doxorubicin, donorubicin, think cardiac toxicity, okay? Getting into the camptothecans, we have topotecan and irinotecan. These are both going to be working to inhibit uh, topoisomerase 1, and these are going to cause, uh, you know, again, myosuppression, nausea, vomiting. What's actually kind of interesting here is that diarrhea is going to be a really big thing, especially with irinotecan, okay? And you think, well, why would this cause diarrhea? And a lot of it has to do with decreasing cholinesterase activity. Okay, so what does cholinesterase normally do? breaks down acetylcholine. Good. So if I have decreased activity of that enzyme, what happens to my acetylcholine levels? It goes up, right? So more acetylcholine, what kind of receptors might it interact with? Muscarinic receptors. And muscarinic receptors, when stimulated, do what in the GI tract? Increase motility, increase peristalsis, increase diarrhea, right? So again, this is a big reason why renatekin is very strong for causing um, Severe diarrhea associated with the, and again, is diarrhea a bad thing in these patients here? It could be, right? Especially if they're having malnutrition issues and they're basically just uh, limiting a lot of uh, waste before it has a good chance of absorbing any of those nutrients, you know, different things like that. So it can be quite problematic, you know, fluid balance, all kinds of different things. And so oftentimes we may give a drug like atropine. You know, we mentioned atropine briefly, I think like in the ophthalmology section. Uh, what does atropine do? Well, it can't, yeah, so we you know it works on the heart, right? It helps to block acetylcholine receptors. So we also will use this for the GI effect. So sometimes patients will have like an as-needed atropine order in order to help counteract the effects of that arena tekin. So it's a really kind of unique one there. So any questions on the topoisomerase inhibitors? Okay. Again, know if there's any particular drug interactions we talk about, side effects that are unique to those agents. Those are things that we'd definitely be uh, consider high yield sort of uh, bits of information to ask on test questions, right? Um, next, we have our alkylating agents. What do you think these are going to do? They're going to alkylate things. I know what they're going to alkylate. 
I shouldn't alkylate DNA. So the majority of agents we've been talking about so far have mainly been cell cycle specific, either for like S phase or M phase, things like that. We tend to find the alkylating agents are really old school group of drugs. They've been around since like World War One. In fact, and that's why I have a mention here of mustard gas. Um, well, basically, these agents are cell cycle nonspecific. They tend to be much harsher in terms of toxicity than you're going to see with some of the other agents that we've talked about. Again, they're all toxic, but these tend to be a little bit worse because they are much more sort of um, nonspecific to even slowly dividing cells can still be affected by these medications because these will actually go through and directly alkylate DNA and cause significant damage here. And these are also really strong vesicants. So this is why these were used as uh, chemical warfare agents. So specifically mustard gas, and we'll talk about the nitrogen mustards in a few minutes, um, but it was severe vesicant, especially if it got down to the respiratory tract, where it would cause severe, severe tissue injury, can cause ARDS, can cause pulmonary edema, and death, right? Uh, so very bad, um, again, why we don't use these in current warfare any further, but um, we still use them because they're actually pretty good at killing off cancerous cells. And so we've been using these since like the mid 40s. Certainly mustard gas goes all the way back to World War I in those cases there. What they do is they covalently bind and add an alkyl group to both proteins and also DNA. DNA is more specific here for our purposes. And actually what's interesting, they can also cause these cross linkings to occur between say the different nucleotides. So normally there's like hydrogen bonds that are keeping the nucleotides held together, but by actually causing covalent bonds, things like DNA polymerase can't come and separate those out anymore. And again, that can trigger off eventual apoptosis, right? They're non-cell cycle specific, so they can kind of be used at any time, no problem there. But they're also going to be extremely cytotoxic. They're going to be mutagenic, teratogenic, carcinogenic. A lot of secondary cancers can come up from use of these medications here. Okay. Also, pulmonary fibrosis is going to be another thing. So again, monitoring PFTs is going to be an important thing for these patients over the long term. Okay, so first off, nitrogen mustards. I caution anyone to put these on their hot dogs, but Nitrogen mustards themselves are actually going to include things like cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide. And we see these used for a lot of different types of solid tumors, you know, prostate, breast, and you know, different things like that. Um, and again, what's uh, unique about these ones right here, cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide, they actually form what they call a toxic metabolite called acrolein. Acrolein is uh, unique because it actually causes this hemorrhagic cystitis. So this would be another one where if you had a patient who develops a blood in their urine, this would probably be one of the most likely sets of drugs to actually cause that, which is hemorrhagic cystitis. And so what we actually can do is give an antidotal drug to help prevent that. And so again, knowing the antidotes are good for specific agents, and here we have one called mesna. Mesna itself actually will bind to and inactivate the acrolein and will prevent that hemorrhagic cystitis. So it's like another really important check that we do as pharmacists is not only do we check the medication, make sure the dose is right and the timing and all that's good, we also double check to make sure that they have the supportive medications ordered as well. So for instance, with like say methotrexate, what else do I want to make sure is ordered if it's appropriate? Bolinic acid, or otherwise known as leucovorin, right? Uh, if I had, say, a patient who's getting, say, donorubicin, I'd want to make sure they have dextrazoxine ordered. For here, I want to make sure they have mesna ordered. Almost every patient getting cyclophosphamide is going to be getting mesna because of the hemorrhagic cystitis. Um, also, we would give very vigorous hydration. Oftentimes, you're going to be seeing these patients are getting a ton, a ton of fluid, liters per hour in some cases, just to make sure that we're flushing all the stuff through the kidneys to prevent buildup and prevent further toxicity from happening here, okay? Other things you can find, you can see some CNS toxicity, especially with iphosphamide. Kind of leave this encephalopathy kind of looking picture here. So if you notice, you know, say mental status is starting to change or um, just anything kind of acting odd in terms of mentation could be related to the medication, okay? Uh, next we have the nitrosoureas. So this includes things like carmistine and lomacine. These ones are kind of interesting in the terms of the different dosage forms that you're going to find. Um, you know, a lot of the anti-metabolites we talked about have oral options that are available. A lot of these other ones we've been talking about, like you know, the uh, topoisomerase inhibitors and the um, alkalinity agents are normally IV, normally administered intravenously. This one's really kind of cool. This is called a gliadel wafer. This is actually carmistine is an alkylating agent and so this is actually a wafer that they would uh, say if you had uh, brain surgery being performed to remove a brain tumor you could then go in and actually put these wafers that have been impregnated with the drug and actually that will slowly release uh, medication into that area over time so basically it'll cover the the skull back up and then the patient will have these wafers in place for a period of time now what's the well, why would we do that we just did can't or we just did surgery to remove that tumor why put that drug in there they may not have gotten every cell, right? You know, the doctor just can't eyeball it and say, oh, that looks like a cancer cell. Let me get that little guy out. You can't do it. So because of that, we'll put the medication there and make sure we kind of cover all that area to help make sure that medication's there to kill off any additional cancerous cells. 
and thus hopefully prevent any kind of recurrence of that brain cancer from coming back, right? And so there's actually some very cool videos. If you want to look up this medication, there's you know, like a five-minute video actually showing the surgery. And it's really kind of fascinating watching them actually put this into place and, and um, seeing them do the whole process. Anyway, um, again, we will find uh, that um, sometimes what we can actually do is prep patients for things like bone marrow transplant. Now, why do you think this medication would be good for prepping someone for bone marrow transplant? So they have leukemia, they have cancerous cells are being produced from their marrow. If we can wipe out all of their cancer cells and basically make them extremely myelosuppressed, we can then transplant in the bone marrow, right? And then allow for that healthy cells to start to take over and then replace what the patient had. So this can actually be some sort of a curative therapy and this is a medication that would be some, uh, that would actually kind of prep them for that. However, the myelosuppression is going to be really severe, especially with these two drugs here. Um, it can be fatal in some cases, right? Just from the infections they may be predisposed to. And um, anyone know what I say, uh, nadir or nadir? Anyone know what that means? Low point. Yeah, it's the low point. And so the question is like, when do you hit that low point? Sometimes it can be very close after you give the medication. Um, in some cases here, it can be delayed four to six weeks, right? So the patient may not even really experience that myelosuppression, that really big risk for infection until four to six weeks later, right? So it's very significant with some of those medications there and it can last up to two weeks. Is there really a big risk for developing viral, bacterial, fungal, any kind of infection could be a big risk for them, right? Um, next we have a couple of drugs. These are really reserved for patients who have like really uh, excellent insurance, right? Because they're platinum. So they gotta have like a black card or a, you know, platinum card in order to get these medications. Just kidding. Um, but they do include platinum in their molecules and this is actually really important for causing a lot of the uh, either inter or intrastrand uh, covalent bonds happening here that disrupts that DNA structure that causes DNA damage here. Um, so this includes that cisplatin, carboplatin, oxaliplatin. So it's easy to remember which ones are the platinum containing drugs so they'll have plat there in the name. And really that joke you normally gets much bigger laughs uh, in previous years so I'm starting to reconsider my opinion of your class now so it's a really good joke. But. Anyway, I'll assume you're too trying to get too much of the information, writing your notes, and you know, you're very involved in that, so good on you. Anywho, um, so other things you're going to see with the platinum-based medications here, nephrotoxicity is a big one. So again, this is another thing we'd want to have really vigorous hydration, again, getting potentially up to liters an hour of, of fluid given intravenously to help flush those kidneys out, thus they can flush that drug through and hopefully prevent it from, um, you know, kind of building up and causing that nephrotoxicity. Ototoxicity is going to be another thing you can see with these drugs. Anyone, anyone remember any other uh, medications caused both nephro and ototoxicity? Vanco and I mean, glycosides, yeah, both of those can do that as well, right? So uh, platinum-based drugs can also tend to do that. Um, peripheral neuropathies, anaphylaxis risk, you know, so again, pretty similar stuff to what we've seen with some of the other classes here. In terms of nausea and vomiting, a lot of the alkylating agents tend to be the worst in terms of their emetogenicity. So you'll actually find when we talk about antiemetic regimens um, that sometimes some patients, you know, say for instance, like with vincristine, relatively low emetogenicity risk. Some patients don't even require any medications in order to treat that, right? They've, they've received it before, didn't have any problems, you don't have to give them anything. Some of these uh, medications here, are, we're having to give two, three, four anti-emetic drugs just to help try to control that nausea and vomiting can be so severe with these medications. So just kind of think about that in terms of it being a bit of a scale gradation here, where alkaline agents can be a lot worse. So some other alkylating agents include things like decarbazine, timozolomide. Um, again, depending on their structures, they may be binding to different things here. So for instance, timozolomide likes to bind to RNA and DNA. It just depends on what their sites of action are really going to be there. And again, very similar to toxicity to what we've seen previously. Uh, Busulfan is kind of interesting because these actually work, uh, it works very similar to the nitrogen mustards, but uh, pulmonary fibrosis is going to be a lot worse with this one than you're going to see with some of the other agents. Um, so busulfan lung is something they talk about in terms of how severe pulmonary fibrosis can be with this one. But any of the alkylating, alkylating agents can do this, but busulfan tends to be a little bit worse. And actually I just I remembered that I did not post up chemo man, did I post that up on Canvas? There's a little guy that I'll post a picture of, his name is chemo man. Uh, and he will actually list out all the different types of um, uh, adverse reactions that you'll see commonly with the different chemotherapeutic agents there. You could probably look up a picture now if you want to uh, to Google it, but I'll, I'll post a picture up to Canvas um, and that will give you a good study guide to remember a lot of the side effects, okay? So just something to, to remember there. Um, and seizures could be a risk as well, so maybe a problem if you have a patient with a history of seizures, busulfan might be a bad drug for them. Okay, so let's talk about a few miscellaneous agents. 
So we can use hormonal therapy. So what type of cancers do you think would be responsive to hormonal agents? Breast cancer, breast cancer right? Because breast cancer can be stimulated by what? Estrogen. Estrogen, good. How about like endometrial cancer? Mm -hmm. Uterine cancer? Mm -hmm. What about like prostate cancer? What would that respond to? Testosterone, right? So again, um, you're going to see that depending on the type of cancer you're dealing with, that by using antagonist, you can prevent that stimulating effect from the normal hormone that the patient will be producing themselves. And so not every type of tumor is going to be hormone sensitive. You may have different types of breast cancer, for instance, that may be more or less hormone sensitive depending on the type you're dealing with. Um, but certainly breast cancer, endometrial, and prostate cancer are the most common ones you're going to see this uh, being used with. And again, their main activities are either to block the actual activity at the receptor site itself for that tissue or to prevent the production of the hormones. Okay. Now, in terms of toxicity, you're going to see that if you're blocking the total production of the hormone, you see a lot more uh, side effects associated with that than just interacting with uh, particular receptors. But we'll talk about that um, as we get into, like, we'll talk about those more in, like, the ob section. Later on, we'll talk more about these in the urology section. we talk about BPH uh, next semester. Actually, corticosteroids, though, could also be utilized for certain types of cancers as well. What do you think these would be good for? Leukemias, right? Why would these be good for leukemias? They suppress the immune system, right? So it makes sense that these would help to block production of things that would stimulate production of new white cells. So oftentimes for leukemias, we'll also give things like dexamethasone. That's probably the most common one I run into, but certainly prednisone has been used as well. Um, not only that, but they have an additional benefit. They actually help to treat nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy, right? So sometimes it's important to know whether a patient's getting the steroid due to the actual treatment for the cancer itself or they're getting it in terms of its use for nausea vomiting because you want to know what the drugs are being used for specifically. Um, so again, those, those two are probably the most common ones you're going to run into, but certainly any corticosteroid could be used there. Now, uh, basically, how these hormones are going to be working is actually at the side of the DNA itself, right? You're going to have different hormone response elements that these will bind to. Um, and normally when you activate those response elements, they will then start to trigger off transcription of different proteins and things like that, which is what can eventually trigger off things like breast cancer tissue to develop more, right? They have those hormone sensitive uh, receptors there. And so these are going to be really um, responsible for driving a lot of growth of those tissues should they be really susceptible to that. And so you'll see that when um, giving hormonal therapy by blocking those receptors or maybe just stopping production of the hormones altogether, you can help to really kind of arrest um, those, uh, the cells from growing further just due to that one particular stimulus. And you have other medications come on board as well that can also help to kind of get rid of them uh, additionally. So as we mentioned, glucocorticoids are good for suppressing white cell counts for like leukemic cells. Um, Antiestrogens are good for things like breast cancer. Um, uh, Antiandrogens are particularly good for like testicular and prostate cancer. So a lot of this is very intuitive based off where you know these hormones actually work. So just to give you a few examples, we have something like tamoxifen or Novadex. This is actually what we call a CIRM. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Normally I say modulator, it means, well, I don't know what it does, right? Sometimes it'll stimulate things, sometimes it'll inhibit things. This is actually one of those cases there um, where it actually is going to be estrogen dependent or used for estrogen dependent breast tumors. Um, and it actually will work as an antagonist in some areas, but an agonist to other areas. So this is really important because especially when you're looking at things like um, estrogen effects on the bones, what does estrogen normally do for the bones? It usually helps to keep them nice and strong and healthy, right? That's why women who have um, uh, who are going through menopause, you have to worry about osteoporosis because they're losing the estrogen effect. And so we can find that if you were to give a drug that blocked all estrogen receptors in the body, what could be a risk? Osteoporosis, right? And, uh, you know, uh, vertebral fractures, hip fractures, it can be a big problem for those patients. So by having something that can work as an antagonist, specifically say in the breast tissue, but an agonist say elsewhere, that can be very beneficial. You can kind of mitigate some of those side effects you'd see maybe over the long term. And again, sometimes these medications will be used if you have like a family history of breast cancer that was really estrogen sensitive. They, uh, that female, even without breast cancer, may be at big enough risk that they'll take this as a preventative potentially. But again, what kind of side effects would you expect to see from reducing estrogen effects in the bodies? Well, it's essentially like putting the woman through menopause in a lot of ways. Um, so they can see things like hot flashes, or as my mom calls it, power surges. You know, it's always good to... <laughs> keep a positive spin on things, I think. Um, but certainly, you know, DVTs can happen from this. You know, normally you think about estrogen, normally can stimulate clotting factor, factor production, and that makes sense, right? So in some ways it works as an anti-estrogen, in other ways it's working as a positive 
uh, estrogen sort of agent. And so you see things like pulmonary embolism and DVT, and also along with still getting things like the hot flashes. Um, also, this works as an agonist in endometrial tissue, which means that if you still have an intact uterus, guess what? You can develop endometrial cancer due to that. Um, so again, a lot of times it's going to be very patient specific in terms of what the patient is going to be receiving in terms of medications. Uh, raloxifen would be one just to kind of compare and contrast um, between tamoxifen and raloxifen. Um, raloxifen is also a serum, but here, instead of being an agonist in the uterine tissue, it's actually an antagonist there in the uterine tissue. So you could use something like this for endometrial cancer potentially. Those responsive to estrogen, right? Um, again, we'll see this more often used in osteoporosis because it is, will block activity in the breast and the uterine tissue, but will actually stimulate estrogen responses in the bone, right? So again, uh, use is going to be very dependent on the patient, what you're using it for. Uh, Fulvestrin is actually going to be something we call a selective estrogen receptor down regulator. So again, this is going to help to basically uh, block all those receptors uh, that would be responsive to estrogen. And so you might imagine that the side effects are going to be much worse than you would see with something like a CIRM. And so you're going to get a lot of the hot flashes, the vasodilation, the nausea, vomiting associated with that. So maybe for like a patient who is, say, non-responsive to tamoxifen, this might be something they would use as a backup agent, right? So you can go into something that's more side effect prone, basically because other things have been non-responsive. Uh, here's an example. So if you recall, there's an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase normally does what? She converts testosterone into, so 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone to DHT. Aromatase converts testosterone into estrogen. So as you might imagine here, say I have a, a drug that blocks the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, what sort of side effects might you see? So you can see the normal reduction in estrogen effects. You can see osteoporosis. You can see things like um, uh, hot flashes and all those sorts of things, you know, um, menstrual irregularities and all kinds of things like that. Um, but certainly you'd also see sort of masculinizing effects as well because you're upping the amount of testosterone they have available to them. So hirsutism and lowering of the voice, you know, things like that could also be a risk as well. Um, so again, you got to take the risk versus the benefits to see, okay, well, where are we actually drawing the line here in terms of what's tolerable by the patient, what's also going to be treating them uh, effectively. And then here's an example of eczemastain would be even stronger because this is actually an irreversible aromatase inhibitor, whereas letrozole would actually be just to be a reversible one. And here you see even se more severe side effects by reducing estrogen levels by like 90%, right? So again, it all goes by gradation in terms of like how severe of a change we need to make here and what kind of side effects we're we willing to live with during those times, right? Here's an example of a few antiandrogens you might see being used for something like prostate cancer, so like flutamide, nilutamide, and bicalutamide. Basically, these would be binding to the androgen receptor and preventing normal testosterone or DHT from actually interacting with those receptors there. And so again, what could you expect to see by reducing testosterone activity in those male patients? Gynecomastia is a big one. What else? What do you think about in terms of like their libido? Probably going to go down, right? You might see impotence develop because of that. So there's a lot of different factors that come into play by monkeying around with the, how um, the hormones are able to work in the body and how selective they're going to be. Another way we could even do is kind of working up higher in the cycle. We could affect actually the hypothalamus, right? So um, for instance, um, we could be, because again, the hypothalamus feeds into what? the interior pituitary, which then feeds down to the, the uh, sex organs. Here, by actually working with GnRH, which normally stimulates release of what from the hypothalamus? Oh, I'm sorry, from the uh, anterior pituitary. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Or LH and FSH, you guys recall that? Yeah, so GnRH, by using something that's an analog of that, what's kind of interesting is that you can either use it in relatively low doses to actually stimulate the production of LH and FSH, which might be good to help put someone into ovulation, right? Or you can use bigger doses and basically kind of shut down production altogether by activating that negative feedback loop and actually can lead to less estrogen and testosterone production in the patients there. So kind of you can use it for either way, uh, depending on, on what you're using it for. But again, in both males and females, you'd be shutting down testosterone and estrogen production pretty significantly in both of them. So that's it for the kind of the, the hormonal-based therapy there. Moving into the biologic response modifiers. These are the ones I mentioned before that are going to be very specific for certain types of proteins or very specific types of receptors that may be expressed in cancer cells that would not be expressed in other types of cells. And so, for instance, like protein kinases, let's say kinase, it just means what? Phosphorylate something, right? And if you recall, all the way back in pharmacodynamics, 
I know we've gone on such a journey. We're almost at the end of Farm 1. But think back to pharmacodynamics and our talk of different receptor types. Remember there's the tyrosine kinase receptors? These are what the, these are going to be targeting essentially. I'll show you some pictures so, so yeah, we can jog your memory. But there's a lot of different ones that are available, a lot of different ones that are expressed in the body. And so, for instance, in the tyrosine kinase receptors, for humans, there's about 90 of them. And they can include things like insulin receptors, epidermal growth factors. There's a lot of different targets here that we could try to shoot for. And it, the point here is that we can be very specific for certain types of cells, and that spares a lot of the healthy cells. So overall, your side effect profile goes down significantly. However, it's much more narrowly focused in terms of who you can use it for. I can use cyclophosphamide or something like um, uh, cisplatin for a ton of different types of cancers. These are going to be very specific towards certain types, as we'll see with a few examples here. And again, normally when you have these uh, tyrosine kinase receptors, they get bound by two different molecules, two different signal molecules come together, and then by getting phosphorylated, then they go and have whatever cellular response. A lot of times for these cancers, they're stimulating things like angiogenesis, stimulating things like mitosis, and by inhibiting that process, you can arrest the cell growth, hopefully. And just to give you an example, how complicated sort of the signaling pathway can be down the road by inhibiting just this one receptor here, which may be more present on a cancer cell versus your normal human cells, you can stop a lot of the downstream cell signaling from occurring. And again, hopefully arrest that mitosis from having that, um, further cell proliferation. So what are some examples of this? So here we have one called imatinib or Gleevec. This is actually an oral agent. This kind of revolutionizes the treatment for a particular type of CML chronic myelogenous leukemia, right? And so this is actually, if they have a, what they call the BCR-ABL mutation, if these people express this one particular mutation, they had this receptor that was available, this drug would come in and specifically target just that. And so it's very selective for those cancer cells. It's spared roughly all the other cells. And in terms of side effects, it's like maybe a little bit of nausea, vomiting, maybe a little bit of edema. Other than that, not nearly as toxic. No myelosuppression, no alopecia, no significant diarrhea associated with these medications. It was really kind of revolutionary. But the number of patients you could use it for, very, very narrow, right? So you have to do genetic testing beforehand to see what they actually express, see if they're a candidate for it. Other examples would be these epidermal growth factors like HERB1 or HER1, and you know, things like gefitinib that may be useful for, say, certain types of non-small cell lung cancer. Again, the very targeted, very specific types of cancers they're going to be dealing with. There's called erlotinib, which is going to be EGFR, tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitor. It can be used for like things like pancreatic cancer, et cetera. Um, again, know why these are important. Know why their mechanisms are going to be different and how they're going to be selective for those cancer cells. Um, again, am I going to ask you specifically which one of these CML mutations is going to be responsive to imatinib? Probably not, right? But I am going to be saying, well, what's the benefit of using a tyrosine kinase inhibitor versus say something like cyclophosphamide, right? So you should know that that specificity is really the important part. I can just give you some other examples, things like capsidib or uh, uh, lapatinib. Oftentimes you'll see these used in combination. So for instance, by using this in combination capsidabine, um, you're going to be able to get further cancer cell death and hopefully um, you, know, you mitigate some of the toxicity by using kind of lower doses of the uh, capsidabine and again, get better um, effects on the tumor there. So for instance, changing the time for tumor growth from say 4.4 to 8 months, really slowing it down pretty significantly in those cases there. So just to give you some examples of how we can use these. So um, we also have the antibodies, right? So we actually have antibodies that are specifically targeted towards specific um, uh, targets here, specific proteins. And we've already talked about monoclonal antibodies. We know there are some downsides to them, including what? Expensive. What's the main side effect you worry about? anaphylaxis, right? Because again, these are foreign proteins, but you can use these for very specific cases here. So for instance, uh, we have rituximab, which targets specifically CD20 on B lymphocytes. So you can find here that 90% of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cells, they express that CD20. So instead of giving something like cisplatin, it's going to affect every single blood cell you have, we can give something like rituximab, it's going to just target the CD20 cells and help to limit their reproduction there, right? By binding, having the antibody bind to that, what does that then trigger off? the rest of the immune system to come and attack that, the complement system, all those things, and basically neutralizes it and prevents it from further growth there. And so again, very, very helpful here. You get the complement mediated lysis, right? Tells us how nice it looks today. Right. No, but remember the complement system comes in, it really helps to, to uh, initiate destruction of that cell and hopefully get rid of the majority of those cancer cells. Now remember, these are frequently given as infusions, right? We can't give these orally. Why is that? 
their proteins, right? Because they're going to get chewed up by the GI tracts. These all have to be given uh, in, via infusions. Some cases, patients may be able to, to administer these at home if it comes like in a pen formulation. A lot of times, we have to give them over extended infusions, so they'll be coming back to the infusion center. Nice thing though is that they have pretty long half lives. So, for instance, um, rituximab will come in for like four weekly infusions. So just one time a week, they'll have to come in for that. But of course, you're going to see things like flu-like symptoms. You're going to see things like nausea, vomiting, and rarely we see the urticaria and bronchospasm, etc. Uh, another example would be like alentuzumab. Again, all, most of these are going to be pretty big mouthfuls in terms of uh, saying their names, but look for the MAB. You're going to know at least what type of drug it is based off of that. These are going to end up binding to CD52 antigens on T and B lymphomas. So they can, again, be very specific in terms of the type of cancers they're going to be treating there. Again, very similar reactions. Now, because these are attacking the immune system, they will have some mild myelosuppression but won't be nearly severe as something like an alkylating agent, okay? So it could have risk for opportunistic infections, and that's why very frequently for a lot of these, what do you have to be tested for before you start them? Sort of latent sort of infection might you have? TB, yeah, so a lot of these patients, they need to get tested for TB beforehand, and if they are positive, then they should not start this medication, right? Also, like, before you start these patients on these medications, do all your vaccines, be uh, vaccines beforehand, because once they're on these med meds, you may find they're not gonna be as effective, right? Uh, trastuzumab is a good one that actually is more targeted uh, for certain types of uh, breast cancer. So, for instance, if they are expressing this HER2 EB, ERBB2 oncogene, again, a very specific type of oncogene they're expressing there, then that drug works super well. If they don't express that, then this drug is not going to be that great for them. Again, just showing you how targeted these uh, specific therapies can be, how much they limit a lot of those side effects. Again, they're oftentimes are used in combination with other agents. So, for instance, like doxorubicin and paclitaxel, you can use these all together and get better kill rates for those cancer cells than you would buy either of these agents alone. Okay. Now, again, if you have um, fevers and chills, you know a lot of patients may experience this, especially with any of these antibodies. This one in particular, again, treat it, treat it supportively, right? If they have fever, give them some Tylenol, right? If they have, um, you know rashes, or to carry things like that, give them diphenhydramine. And actually, there's this other drug called meperidine. Anyone know what that's, uh, what kind of drug that is? It's actually a opioid analgesic. It's actually called Demerol is the brand name. Anyone ever heard of Demerol? Yep. So we don't use it too frequently anymore, but in some cases, we'll use it for what we call rigors. So the patient's having like uncontrollable shivering. As secondary to these effects here, we can actually give them meperidine and use it for that. You'll see this a lot in surgery uh, for patients who develop rigors there. Um, again, just another example, cetuximab here. This one would be targeting uh, specific epidermal growth factors. You can use for things like colorectal cancer, head and neck cancer, things like that. All of them are going to have very similar sort of uh, adverse effects, but note the ones that are specifically targeting the immune system are going to have that mild, mild suppression. These agents here, like cetuximab, would not have that. And then there's another one, bevacizumab, would be working on this VEGF uh, factor here. This actually works on the angiogenesis, so why would this be useful for cancer? Yeah, it helps to decrease that blood supply available to those cancerous cells. Um, so that can be very, very useful from, from that standpoint. This one's actually kind of interesting because you can develop things like severe hypertension, proteinuria, and CHF. So some of it has to do probably with those, those factors that are useful uh, in stimulating angiogenesis, and that can lead to the hypertension that can develop there. So just something to note. So just another kind of miscellaneous agent here, we have one called um, asparaginase or L-SPAR. This one's actually kind of interesting uh, because it has a novel mechanism compared to other things that we've seen here. Um, so for instance, we have asparagine, which is a normal uh, amino acid that's necessary for protein synthesis. And what you tend to find is that a lot of normal cells can just make these themselves, right? They can either take it from the blood supply or they can, get, um, they can produce it themselves. And you can kind of see this how there's um, asparagine the cells can then convert it over with the asparaginase into aspartate. Your normal cells can go ahead and convert this back over. However, what you find is that a lot of lymphoid tumors are actually low in this enzyme. They cannot cause this conversion to occur here. And so what we can actually do is by giving asparaginase, a synthetic form, we can deplete the asparagine levels such that our normal cells are okay. They can go ahead and still make all the asparagine they need. However, these lymphoid cells, they're not going to be able to make that conversion unless you kind of starve them of that amino acid and thus they cannot produce those proteins and thus they lead to eventual cell death. So again, just another way we can try to target the specific characteristics of cancer cells versus say or otherwise healthy cells. Okay. Um, again, a lot of allergic reactions associated with these mainly due to the fact that, again, it's a foreign protein we're giving these patients here. And again, sometimes you have these weird side effects that pop up here, things like intracranial hemorrhage, while rare, can still occur here. Things like ammonia toxicity can develop because of this. So these are things you might want to be monitoring for. Right? 
And then sometimes we'll actually try to use the host's own immune system against the types of cancers. We call this immunotherapy, where basically we're going to use and try to stimulate the host's immune system to attack those cancerous cells. Because again, when we give chemotherapy, is it just the drug that's affecting cancerous cells? No, your other bits of your immune system can still target those cells. They realize that they're aberrant, they need to get rid of them. Macrophages can still be very useful there. So we can stimulate that immune system, hopefully help us out. So we have things like interferon. We'll talk more about this when we get into talking about hepatitis later on uh, next semester here, but these are also used for certain types of cancer. Um, but again, they kind of increase that cytotoxicity of natural killer cells. They increase the ability for macrophages to chomp down on all those cancer cells. Um, and so they will then help the immune system to clear those cancer cells a little bit faster. And so you can see these used for things like Kaposi sarcoma, which we talked about uh, being you know, associated with, with AIDS. We talked about uh, different types of cancers, like le uh, leukemias they can be used for, a lot of different purposes. The most common place you probably would have seen it would have been in treatment for hepatitis, like especially hepatitis C. Nowadays that's changing, and so you probably will not see it used for that indication, but we'll talk about that next semester. Um, again, given via sub-Q because it is a protein we're giving there. Um, I'll have to give it multiple times. The thing I do want to know with interferon is it has a lot of side effects associated with it, mainly due to the fact that if you're ramping up the immune system, how do you think patients would respond to that? Well, if your immune system is ramped up, how do you respond? fevers, chills, arthralgias, headache, you feel miserable, right? Because that makes sense because we're ramping up that immune system there. Um, also, it's really interesting here are some of the mental status changes that can actually come along with this. So for instance, you can have worsening depression. You can have aggressive behavior associated with this. Um, some patients, they would talk about, if they were on interferon, they talk about interferon brain, where their significant others always knew when they were going on a round of it, that they were going to be miserable to be around just because they became just kind of raging jerks essentially because the medication was causing them to have this increased aggression so kind of a unique sort of side effect that you know doesn't seem likely due to the mechanism but it's still something we normally see there and then another one here aldous lucan this is actually basically a recombinant form of il2 right il2 we know is an important inflammatory mediator that stimulates um, activity of our leukocytes and again we can give this in order to help um, just stimulate the immune system to attack those cancer cells and so, again, turning on things like natural killer cells, uh, inducing things like interferon gamma, helps to kind of ramp up that immune system. Again, can work better along with other chemotherapeutic agents in order to get rid of those cells. Now, note this is a recombinant form of human, so you know less likely to have an immune reaction to that. But just know that because it's made in E. coli, there's still some of that protein that can be residual there, and so we can still have some reactions. So you want to be aware of that. And again, just some examples of different cancers you could use it for. A lot of side effects associated with this, mainly due to one, you're ramping up the immune system, so similar to the interferon. This one's interesting because it can cause this capillary leak syndrome, or basically causes the capillaries to become more leaky, those openings open up, and then all that fluid kind of rushes out. So hypotension is pretty common with this one. So you'd want to make sure you're giving the patient plenty of fluids beforehand, and then also have uh, pressors on hand, things like dopamine or epinephrine available in order to counteract that. Okay. So again, some of these things seem intuitive based on the mechanism, sometimes they're just not, right? Again, so we should always be really careful using this drug in patients like pulmonary, cardiac, renal toxicity, because again, that fluid issues are can be more pronounced with those patients there, right? So it'd be something that I certainly want to be worried about. Okay, so those are kind of the agents that we're going to be talking about there. I know a lot of those last ones were sort of quick, but again, I just want to show you the kind of the breadth of different agents we have available to us. Um, and again, no generalizer mechanism. If there's any unique side effects associated with them, those are good things to know. Now I want to focus a little bit more on the dosing and administration of these agents here. Um, as I mentioned, many regimens are count dependent. Again, what I, which two counts are you normally looking at? I've already talked about. A and C, the absolute neutrophil count, and usually the platelets is going to be the other one. Um, again, you're also looking for things like uh, renal function. You're looking at the urinalysis. You're looking for things like specific gravity sometimes before we'll be actually administering, uh, we're giving fluids to make sure we're getting the urine dilute enough. We'll check the specific gravity before giving some chemo agents. Um, and again, watch how the drugs are being dosed. Sometimes it'll be age dependent. Sometimes it's based off their body's surface area. Sometimes it's weight based. And it's very easy to screw that up if you're looking at the wrong information. Uh, and for instance, say your patient um, has their weight put down in pounds instead of kilograms by the nurse. You know, what could that lead to? I think, I think overdosing or underdosing? Severe overdosing, right? Because there's 2.2 pounds for every kilogram. And most of our dosing we've seen for drugs is in what? Kilograms or pounds? Kilograms, right? All of you should be very comfortable being able to convert between kilograms and pounds. 
because you'll have to do that quite a bit out there in the clinical world, right? You never know what things are being measured as, but you want to make sure that's all accurate. Um, and so in terms of safety and handling, now are these chemotherapeutic agents, especially a lot of the, the um, alkylating agents and, and agents like that, um, are they just dangerous to the patient? Who else can be dangerous to? Us, right? Anyone who's actually working with the drugs and administering it. So proper PPE is super necessary, right? PPE stands for what? Personal, Personal protective equipment, right? Now, does anyone here have any PPE on? Technically, your scrubs are PPE, right? So ideally, if you're going to work in the clinical setting, you'd not wear the same scrubs as you're wearing there. And, you know, and always see this, like, people always, like, wear the scrubs into the hospital, and they walk out, and they're, like, going to Walmart, and they're going to do whatever. And it's, like, you got, like, pseudomonas and MRSA all over your scrubs. Like, what are you doing spreading that stuff around, right? Change, change out of that stuff. But anyway. Um, Yeah, so that's actually a good point there. Um, you have to consider some of their excreta, so things like urine, things like their feces, things like sweat potentially could have some contaminants there. Usually, uh, patients will, um, you know, I don't know that they necessarily recommend changing their clothes. It's probably not a bad idea, um, but certainly we think about things like wet diapers and things like that, especially from the pediatric side, as certainly being potentially hazardous to other people, right? So that's why we want to make sure they have specific biohazard uh, containers available to get rid of that stuff. But what are some other types of PPE you'd want to consider using if you're handling these dangerous medications? Gown, obviously, yep. So you can see any splash, what else? Gloves, certainly. Hmm? Face mask, yeah, face mask can be useful. So, and ideally these, can, these uh, systems are designed to where uh, the patient should not have um, any ability for the medication to come out of the IV line or the bag or anything, but stuff sprays sometimes. I'll tell you, we had this one case where, um, you know, imagine if you were in, stuck in the hospital and you're getting five days worth of this continuous methotrexate um, and you were, say, like 13. Now, did any of you always listen to your parents when you were 13? Probably not, right? And you'd probably be pretty bored if you're stuck in the hospital room for five days straight, right? So what do patients like to do? Well, they like to go around, roam around, see what else is going on. So this is where we're still pretty early on. We'd opened up, so it's not super busy. It's a Saturday. And this kid's walking around with his IV poles, got his methotrexate running, right? So then something happened where one of my technicians was walking around, and he saw the patient, you know, and all of a sudden the patient got the line snagged on something, and it ended up ripping out of the bag, and now there's methotrexate going everywhere. It's on the patient, it's on the floor, it's getting into the carpet. The question is like, my technician, if you don't know any better, you have no idea what's in the, actually in that bag, right? So if he goes to try to help the patient out, guess what? He could have contaminated himself with that medication there. So that's why it's really important to have like good spill protocols in place to make sure that you can help uh, contain that stuff, um, get environmental services to come and help out. That can be a really big problem there, right? So anyway, so PPE is really important. Think about shoe covers too, right? A lot of your shoes may be like leather or some kind of cloth that can actually hold on to those medications. So it's something just to think about. Anyway, and again, um, depending on um, how long they're considered hazardous for afterwards, it could be dependent on the half-life of the drug, how long that's sticking around. So it's going to be very dependent on the, on the actual agents there. So in terms of supportive care, what other things can we give to these patients? Well, um, we know that myelosuppression is a rate-limiting issue here, right? So what we can do is try to give colony-stimulating factors. Agents are going to have to stimulate the white cells to start to replicate, right? So you can see things like, um, you know, basically depending on the agent we're using, we'll give these several days afterwards to kind of replace those neutrophils they're not going to be producing anymore. Some of them can be used to make platelets. Some of them are most often going to be used to make things like your granulocytes, monocytes, etc. okay? Um, and again, um, not going to be used all the time, but it can be used in order to especially help with like, you know, the red blood cell count, their hemoglobin's low. We can use things like erythropoietin to help kind of stimulate that up. But again, um, one thing you always want to note as well is that with patients being at big risk for infection, like even think about their family coming to visit them. You know, if people are sick in the hospital, what do you want, what do you want to take to them? Things like flowers, right? Say, oh, get well soon. Well, guess what flowers are covered in? bacteria and fungi and mold and all kinds of stuff, you know, so that's something we say, hey, actually don't bring any flowers, right? Or for instance, if they were going to be um, eating fruits, right? Make sure the fruits that you can peel the outside off of, right? Because again, that can help to get rid of some of those extra bacteria and things that are there. Um, also, one thing you do want to make sure you know is that anytime you have a neutropenic patient, you never ever want to um, administer anything rectally. Why do you think that's the case? So no rectal temperatures, no DREs, no enemas, suppositories, why do you think that would be the case? Remember we said that a lot of the rapidly dividing cells are being affected, so that also includes their GI epithelia. So that means that tissue there, it's more friable, right? What's friable mean? Mm 
can fry it. No, no it means it's more brittle. It's more. Uh, it's, it's just more likely to break, right? And so you can find things if you were to say take a rectal temperature on these patients, that tissue is going to be more delicate. It's going to be more likely to cause trauma. And then what happens is all the bacteria in the rectum gets into their bloodstream. And guess what? Now they have an infection, right? So these are things you have to think about in terms of supportive care for these patients. It can be very specific for patients receiving chemotherapy. So also think about uh, in terms of things like the, the mucositis, super painful for them. They may not want to take anything PO, liquids, food, anything like that. But good oral hygiene is super important. So things like salt rinses, you can even use a disinfectant called chlorhexidine that keeps the mouth clean in order to make sure they don't have any oral infections that can develop from that, okay? We'll talk much more about antiemetics next section when we, are, when we get into GI next semester, so don't worry too much about that. Um, that'll be an important thing. And I just want to give you an idea of things um, in terms of emetogenic potential, how they can range depending on the drug you're dealing with. So for instance, um, high risk, greater than 90% likely to cause nausea, vomiting, right? So we have things like cisplatin, we have things like um, that carbazine, cyclophosphamide. Notice a lot of the alkylating agents are on this list. Very high metagenic potential, right? And would you want to receive any medication that said there's a better than 90% chance you're going to throw up? No, who likes to throw up? Nobody does. It's awful. Um, and so, again, patients can sometimes even have what they call anticipatory nausea and vomiting because they had such a bad reaction last time, they even think about getting that drug again. You ever have like a really bad, like eat something really bad, and then like the next time you smell that food, you're just like, Bleh. they do the same thing when they're about to receive chemo. And so oftentimes we have to give them um, anti-anxiety medications to try to calm them down just so that way they don't have that anticipatory nausea and vomiting. A lot of it goes into that. So it's a big, big side effect because people feel so miserable. Um, in terms of alopecia, is there anything we can do for them? No, once the hair is gone, it's kind of like to let it grow back once the, um, uh, the chemo is finished. Um, certainly, though, it's considered sometimes it comes back a little bit different texture, so the color might be a little bit different, so that's something that may be really distressing for the patient. And then we did mention the extravasation, how that's a really big risk, okay? So um, different agents require different therapies, but just know the ones that we talked about as being really bad vesicans, mainly the vinca alkaloids, taxanes, and the anthracyclines. So I'm sorry I went through that quickly, but I wanted to make sure we were done on time. Do you have any questions about anything? Oh, thank you. It is my birthday today. What am I doing? I'm teaching you guys. I said I want to make sure I get some good face-to-face -face time with my peeps. No. Uh, uh, oh, we have a surprise for you. Oh no. That's not good. Let me read the other question. Okay, uh, why do we bother with the mustards that their side effects are the worst? Um, they're super effective, right? They're really good at killing off those cancer cells. So sometimes if risk versus benefits, it's going to be um, uh, what leads you to decide to use those. And so it's built into a lot of regimens, certainly. Uh, okay, any other questions? Anything else? The surprise left. Oh, no. <laughs> no more surprise. Well, if nothing else, that's the end of the test material. Next time we meet, it'll be a test review, and then you'll be done with Farm 1. It's pretty exciting, eh? Yay! Yay. Don't worry, EpiBio is still going, so we'll deal with that. <laughs>